Boris, we are here again at the Spinnaker Summit. Yes, the first real Spinnaker the Summit. The first real. Yeah. So what role has Mirantis played in this <clears throat> summit? Well, we are the highest level sponsor. I mean, there's the diamond sponsor, which is Netflix, and they basically put on the show, but uh, we are the highest level sponsor. Um, we uh, basically uh, worked very closely uh, with uh, the Netflix team on actually, you know, um, figuring out components of the agenda. Uh, we have multiple talks here. I'm going to be doing a keynote tomorrow on, you know, the possibility of Spinnaker uh, becoming a standard for continuous delivery, much like Kubernetes is a standard for uh, container scheduling. Um, we, uh, you know, since we've talked, actually launched Spinnaker training certification. Um, and actually the big focus for us in this summit is uh, promoting that training certification. We believe that, uh, you know, open source projects follow a certain adoption curve and uh, um, Spinnaker is still kind of, you know, at a place where there's a few power users, but most users are kind of trying to evangelize Spinnaker in their organization, try to get the broader organizational buy-in, try to get more development teams to use it. And uh, things like training certification is a way to actually help accelerate that. So um, we are investing in that heavily. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's us at the summit. <laughs> right. Uh, we talked last time, I think we have talked about Spinnaker a couple of times. So where is Spinnaker community today? The community is growing. If you look at the, um, just the dynamic of the Spinnaker Slack channel, which Andy likes to talk about, and I think with you know, early projects, looking at things like that is one of the ways to actually measure the project velocity. So he mentioned there is like 5,400 or something like that active users in the Spinnaker Slack channel, but most importantly, like, you know, the, the growth, right? Um, and, and who is there uh, that, that I think is important to pay attention to. So um, it's adding probably like 100, 150 new people that are coming into the channel uh, because they want to kind of start interacting with community every month, right? So it's a substantial, substantial growth. Um, the, uh, I think, interesting aspect and it's kind of like a double-edged sword um, of, you know, who are the people that are coming into the uh, Spinnaker community? Who are the people that are participating in the Slack channel? So if you look at, uh, for instance, um, like the history of OpenStack, it was mostly uh, um, during the initial wave of growth, very uh, vendor dominated. There's a lot of vendors and there's people from all kinds of big companies sitting. So the Spinnaker is actually a, kind of like almost an overcorrection in the opposite direction where it's uh, very heavily uh, user dominated. So most of the people in the Spinnaker Slack channel are actually users that are doing something of Spinnaker. And, you know, the common wisdom is like, oh, it's great because there is adoption there and there's a lot of users, but I think that for any open source community to really uh, be healthy and to thrive, there has to be a certain balance between vendors and users. And users' indication of adoption and users actually help kind of uh, define the roadmap in terms of real problems that exist uh, within the you know platform architecture. But the vendors are the ones that are able to take on kind of a longer term, bigger strategic problems. So if I'm, you know, like a, a user of Spinnaker, like Salesforce, for instance, and I have a problem with, you know, the architecture and the different services being too chatty, like you need to do a lot of work to solve that problem. I can maybe like make a plugin or write a patch if I'm a user, but I'm not going to invest into like a 15, 20 person team and pool a large kind of a rewrite or re-architecture initiative, right? So the vendors can typically take care of the uh, longer term roadmap items. And I think that the user part is really kind of solved in the Spinnaker context, and there's a lot of contributions, but the vendor part, it's like just Google and Netflix, for the most part, other people contributing. So I think that the next wave of growth for the community has to be um, you know, various vendors also investing and backing the community with you know, teams, resources that can work on solving some of these bigger problems. So what is the reason that the Spinnaker community is so different from, let's say, OpenStack community. 
the balance between the vendor versus the users? Yeah, um, it, it has to do with just, you know, the history of how the community has evolved and how the community has been kind of advertised and promoted. So OpenStack community um, almost kind of a started as an answer to, you know, the lack of open source cloud standard that they could sell. So Amazon was taking over the world, everybody wanted cloud, everybody wanted private cloud, they were coming to their vendor of choice, you know, I work with Cisco or I work with HP or I work with Oracle, and they're like, okay, give me an alternative that is in my data center, and they're like, well, we don't have it. And then when OpenStack was born, all of the vendors just swarmed and said, oh, that's it, you know, now we have a standard for it. And they started investing in it, and it was very heavily vendor dominated, whereas the user base kind of tagged along and started growing later, right? Um, and there's a foundation around it right away. Now, if you look at the evolution of Spinnaker, it was, you know, written by a user effectively to solve their specific problem, Netflix. And they kind of open sourced it just because, you know, to show how cool Netflix is and for recruiting purposes. There was no plan really to actually grow a real community or make it something that vendors would take advantage of. And they've been running like that for several years, right? So it was very closed, um, you know, just Netflix and then Google joined later. And most of the people that actually comprise the community are not the ones that were taking it and trying to sell it. The ones that like just, oh, Netflix is doing it. So, you know, I'll take it and I'll also use it for my own internal needs. So the user community kind of grew, but there was no formal governance and no foundation and no promotion and no vendor involvement. So it overgrew this kind of a user part of the community with fairly little vendor involvement. And it has also something to do with that there was already a big challenge for the continuous delivery and suddenly they had a solution which was already being used, not in case of OpenStack or the community which is being developed, it was already yeah. used internally. Um, so you're talking about it's for, the, for the users? For that, users, that, so because they, they are looking yeah. at a technology which has already proven itself. It's not like they're starting something from the ground up. Uh, yes, yes. And I think a lot of it also was not even so much like, let me build a continuous delivery thing internally. It's more like, you know, what are the best practices for going to public cloud? That was the main driver because Netflix is famous for being the guys that were the first ones to go all in on public cloud and specifically Amazon. Right, so, and, and, and the guys that were following, they're like, okay, well, how do we do that? How do we replicate that success? How do we deploy to cloud? And, they're like, and, and as this initiative starts, they're like, oh, well, Netflix is doing Spinnaker, well, let me do Spinnaker too. And that actually fueled a lot of the uh, adoption among the users. Right, so uh, uh, it, it, can, can it be seen as the answer to the continuous delivery problem that we are facing, or we are still? Um, well, so, you know, like there's, I wouldn't say that there is like a continuous delivery problem out there. Right. There is, you know, um, an evolving pattern where mm. companies are starting to, you know, um, adopt and starting to kind of, you know, um, continuously deliver their products. So it's like a new way of, of basically building software. Um, and. It's not like there's a, there's a problem with continuous delivery, there's a problem with it being early and it's also being very heavily dominated by um, DIY solutions um, and being very fragmented. And I think that uh, what Spinnaker brings to the table is uh, a way to kind of uh, consolidate the market around uh, you know, a single best practice, a single answer um, kind of a standard for how you do continuous delivery. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it. And then the, the concern that I have is kind of like, uh, OpenStack was very quick to solve the, uh, you know, the, the private cloud problem, right? But uh, when it comes to continuous delivery, it's, it's higher up the stack and the DIY solutions are more sticky because when you get higher up the stack, there is value, of course, in Spinnaker's technology, but there's also a lot of value in um, the best practices and the business process that you as a company have encoded into your DIY solution, right? Um, and because it's so tightly connected to like the business process, the, uh, you know, 
it's not very easy to go ahead and replace, you know, Jenkins plus DIY with Spinnaker. Um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, uh, I think that is going to happen. The question is, you know, how long is it going to take? And how fast can something like Spinnaker um, displace a lot of the DIY that's out there for doing continuous delivery? So what is the biggest hurdle uh, customer or users face when they adopt and embrace Spinnaker? Um, I mean, it's first of all, there's a bunch of stuff which is typical of any new community that is not specific to Spinnaker, like, you know, lack of resources, you know, there is no, you know, single way for getting Spinnaker deployed or, you know, one prescribed way for doing Spinnaker HA. Um, so, you know, people kind of coming in on their like, learning and experimenting and some experiments actually fail and to, you know, make them more successful, they need more expertise. So they try to find people that know how to do Spinnaker and there's not that many of them. So all of this kind of a standard early adoption hurdles. Um, and also, I think there are a few kind of a fundamental problems with the Spinnaker architecture. Um, that kind of need to, over time, evolve away. Let's put it this way. Um, one of the biggest is, uh, you know, the, the issue of, uh, you know, how easy it is to, to plug it in to something, right? So the issue of pluggability with Spinnaker. So on the positive side, everybody in the community, if you hear like Andy Glover talk, he says that pluggability is paramount. That's, you know, one of the core tenets. But uh, because it evolved, as like a Netflix centric tool um, to solve their specific problem. Um, they never really thought about building like a very reusable, pluggable framework. So when we're talking about writing a plugin for Spinnaker, like if I want to plug into my like database backend or I want to write a new custom deployment stage or very common is that like I want it to work with, uh, you know, Amazon EKS rather than EC2 or some other cloud service. Uh, what that means is that you actually need to like fork the code. You need to go in and change the code and some of the components with a lot of dependencies, including changes to the UI to make that work. And then you merge the code back. You can't actually like, you know, create a new repo and just write a plugin following specific set of rules that, you know, talks to a specific limited set of APIs and just, you know, plop it there and make it work. It's really actually like changing the core code of the platform. Right. And I think that this concept of pluggability is paramount to the success and growth of any open source community, and particularly to open source community that is in the CD space. And um, like, you know, as we've kind of dwelled into um, the Spinnaker world, this has been the number one problem with our customers. Like, because every customer has a slightly different, you know, deployment target, slightly different set of things that need to interface with a continuous delivery tool. And being able to do it very quickly and seamlessly, write all these plugins is very important. And I think that Spinnaker community could do probably, a, you know, some important work on evolving Spinnaker's architecture towards being more plugin friendly. Right. And when we talk about Spinnaker community, have you finalized any, any governance model around it yet? So you probably saw that uh, Andy has announced just at his keynote this morning the uh, first kind of, you know, draft of a governance model that's been adopted, which is a huge leap forward. If you remember, we talked six months ago, was it at KubeCon? And I was talking about, you know, that potentially becoming the next important thing for them. Um, so today there is, you know, if, if before I'm a contributor, like, you know, there's, I have to basically like know Stephen Kim or Andy Glover or go like make some friends in a Slack channel, like how do you become a committer? How do you contribute? There's no way to do it. Now they've actually formalized that it's not very detailed, kind of, you know, uh, very in-depth, fully thought out kind of a, you know, governance model, but it is way, way better than the complete lack of it. So there is a formal, you know, like a wiki page that describes what you need to do to become a committer, how you merge, etc. Um, so I think it's very important uh, that's what's happening. I think that the next happening is this needs to evolve further. As people start contributing, there's going to be a lot of edge questions. Like, you know, if, uh, you know, I'm writing a plugin and I wrote a load of code, 
can I merge that? Like there has to be some kind of, you know, um, kinks worked out along the way. And I also think that, uh, you know, the next step would be for Spinnaker to be donated to some foundation um, that can actually take it on its own kind of independent path, which will actually help bring, I think, more vendors that can take and then solve big problems in the Spinnaker community, like, for example, the lack of the plugin framework. So, you know, like OpenStack Foundation or CNCF or Apache Foundation, whatever it is, um, I think is gonna be a, a big important step towards taking the community development to the next level. Since Google is already involved with this project and Google also has Kubernetes and there are always parallels drawn between Kubernetes and Spinnaker, even the Kubernetes Qnode, uh, yeah. Spinnaker is becoming. So can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, um, one of the things that, of course, because Kubernetes is like the hottest thing since sliced bread now, everybody wants Kubernetes. Um, a lot of the uh, greenfield activities um, in the infrastructure space are tied to Kubernetes. And the Kubernetes team um, is, you know, able to make a lot of decisions and influence the direction, right? So if I'm going to cloud, Typically, Kubernetes is there because that's my way to do, you know, multi-cloud with no lock-in. If I'm moving to containers and re-architecting my applications, that's Kubernetes is there. If I'm trying to adopt DevOps, Kubernetes is there. There's always a Kubernetes team. And that Kubernetes team has a lot of influence over what tools I use. Does Spinnaker use? Does something else used? Um, in the context of the overall initiative. Um, and if you look at, uh, you know, a, a lot of the talks uh, that are happening, uh, today and tomorrow, um, as well as uh, what the community is working on, there is a lot of, um, you know, a lot of work being done to make Spinnaker Kubernetes friendly. They had the V1 provider, now they just released the V2 provider, people are trying to use it, yada yada. But I think that if uh, you go to like KubeCon um, and you talk to the Kubernetes developers and, you know, very few people have actually, uh, you know, heard of Spinnaker or, you know, are choosing proactively to use Spinnaker as, you know, their way to do continuous delivery into Kubernetes. And the reason for it is twofold. One is uh, simply because of, you know, lack of the marketing aspect. It's not a part of the foundation. It's still kind of, it's very promising, but a smaller project that a lot of people outside of this continuous delivery domain, such as, uh, you know, Kubernetes people haven't heard about. But two, very importantly, is also the fact that Spinnaker was never really built, in my view, um, with a developer in mind. Um, it was built as a, you know, a tool for the ops team to manage the delivery process. And um, you know, in a um, you know, dev ops equation, the dev part is kind of carrying more and more weight. And I don't think that any tool any DevOps tool, be it continuous delivery tool or CI tool or whatever, uh, that wants to be a player in the space can be exclusively focused just on the ops. It has to be also developer friendly. And the way Spinnaker is built, it's, it's pretty big, it's pretty heavy, you know, it takes some effort to actually set it up, install it. And if I'm a developer hacking on Kubernetes, I'm not gonna go and, you know, take this, you know, big hunk of Java code that is Spinnaker and go set it up on, you know, several VMs. I can't, it, it, it's, it's even like virtually impossible to set it up on a laptop even, right? So um, I think that's another important area for Spinnaker community to tackle, right? So if, I think it's absolutely important for Spinnaker to be relevant to, you know, Kubernetes developers. Um, and it's also completely clear that you know, in this current shape or form as this heavy Java based tool, as a developer, I'm not going to go and like play around with it and then go and sell it to, you know, my boss and say, oh yeah, that's the best tool to develop, to deploy on Kubernetes. And in parallel, Kubernetes is also actually deploying its native tools for doing Kubernetes deployments. Like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a Kubernetes, uh, you know, stateful sets, there's a deployment object now where you can actually define how the deployment is done for Kubernetes. So like the Kubernetes community is evolving and kind of, you know, building its own Kubernetes centric deployment patterns. Um, I think that it's important that in the next, 
couple of years or a year, um, Spinnaker really bridges into the Kubernetes community um, or it risks Kubernetes evolving away on its own path. And then, you know, it's, it's not going to be good. <laughs>